Fantastic. Um, now we're going to call um, our friends from BCG to the stage. This is, uh, I think, if not the most popular session, one of the two most popular sessions um, that we have. We call this internally in CGLA the Jeff and Mark show. It looks like it's going to be the Jeff and Mark and Santiago show. But it's really fantastic to see their view and their vision of, uh, of, of where the global infrastructure market is going. You hear us? Lights on. There'll be no dancing for this show, but hopefully it'll be a good one. So, Jeff, we, go talk, ahead. Um, we talk a little bit about today, I think, which is maybe a <coughs> different than past sessions. Obviously, we've had a lot of good discussion this morning about all the things uh, you know that we can do to, to help remedy the funding gap, to get more funds and create them. Um, but you know. For us, having been at these for a number of years and other conferences, I think probably often the area that we feel like is missed is, you know, what can everyone in this room as a project owner, a government, or an engineering and construction firm do directly to help mitigate a substantial portion of that gap? And so what we'll talk about today, uh, which is one of the pillars you saw in the Blueprint 2025 agenda, is around the technology revolution and what we think uh, technology can do to actually address a large share of the infrastructure gap uh, around the world. Um, so there's lots of different views. I think you've heard from many different speakers, their perspective on the infrastructure gap. So there's lots of ways to calculate this. But our perspective, uh, if you kind of build up from what the OECD says, the global demand for infrastructure is every year. Uh, and this is taking it over the last 20 years as an annual average, is about $3.7 trillion in annual spending. And if you just look at the supply of actual projects uh, in any given year, it's only about $2.7 trillion in actual project supply. So in general, on a global basis, you're creating an incremental trillion-dollar infrastructure gap per year. You can obviously have other definitions, depends on what you believe is, is optimal. Uh, but regardless, it's a pretty large number, and when you accumulate that over a long period of time, uh, it gets quite substantial. Uh, but we juxtapose that on the other side with, with a, a bit of a conundrum, because one of the big challenges in infrastructure is today we're paying a lot more to get a lot less uh, than we used to 40 years ago. Uh, it's interesting to compare overall uh, business productivity measured, you know, in kind of a Moore's Law sense of uh, non-farm business labor productivity to construction labor productivity over the last, now, say, 46 years. Uh, one is obviously a, a huge step change in productivity, uh, but arguably today, you know, construction uh, is significantly worse on a real basis than it was 40 years ago. Uh, there's many reasons for that, driven by, you know, some amount of the regulations people have talked about, probably some good things that have happened along the way in terms of safety, but also there frankly hasn't been a major technological revolution that would allow the construction sector to sort of benefit of some of the Moore's Law type logic that you've seen in technology and other spaces. And we think uh, right now we're at a, a point in time where there's an opportunity for a sea change on that and to, have to bend the curve so that it looks more like the kind of productivity that you would expect in other industries. Um, so actually, I'll, I'll skip to the next page. I think what's really exciting, I guess, from our perspective is, you know, there's not just one technology sort of reshaping the world, uh, but there's an awful lot of technologies all coming to bear at the same time uh, that we think play you know, really significant aspects and how we can help close the infrastructure gap to some extent. And what we thought we'd just do today is maybe take you on just a little short tasting menu of the art of the possible. I think by definition, there's going to be an expert in this room uh, who lives and breathes this uh, at each individual level more than certainly any of us. And as we get into a broader discussion, would invite 
uh, people from the floor, obviously, to take questions who are, who are deep technology experts. But, but to pick just a few on this page, you know, what you can increasingly do with big data and analytics platforms are radically transforming uh, the way people are thinking about how to plan projects and how to think about them differently from the start. As also, from an O&M perspective, how do you fundamentally manage things like the traffic flows in a city in real time uh, in ways that people were never able to do before? You know, with, with the, uh, you take the two in the middle, 3D scanning and additive manufacturing, which is a, a fancy way of saying 3D printing, uh, the amount of time, materials cost, and weight that people are able to take out of things that would have required a multi-step fabrication and welding process before is tremendous, as well as allowing, obviously, to manufacture in shapes uh, and things that were never possible before. You have any of you who've you know, been to the, uh, the Gaudi church that's been under construction for years and years in Barcelona, some of the ability to move it forward is only possible now with the advent of 3D printing and what, what it can allow you to model. Uh, robotics and sensors are also playing a key role in our mind going forward. Uh, you know, take for instance, probably one of the most neglected uh, pieces of infrastructure in the U.S. is our bridges. You know, if you look at the evaluation of that, but obviously there's not enough money to fix every bridge in the U.S. But imagine uh, if you could put them together with packages of sensors and cameras such that you could say, we will have a very data-driven and analytical way to know what to fix, where we can extend useful life, uh, you know, the opportunity to save money relative to just, you know, fixing everything, quote unquote, uh, we think is quite substantial. So we'll take you, we'll take you through a few examples, I think, um, here as we move through this and then talk a little bit at the end about what we think um, the opportunity might be worth as it relates to the gap we talked about up front. Um, this page is a bit of an eye chart, but just to say that the digital revolution that we're talking about applies to every part of the value chain of engineering construction. There are huge opportunities in planning and prioritization and on the regulatory side. Uh, we'll talk about ways that design and engineering are being revolutionized from this. Uh, construction, obviously, there's a lot of things there we'll talk about as well, and, and especially on O&M. It all comes to bear, and I think as people have talked about before, and we'll spend less time on this because I think other experts have mentioned this, but, but BIM is playing a critical role, obviously, as one centerpiece across all of that. And although BIM, quote unquote, has been around for a long time, in our mind, we're just now starting to see a real, a real utilization of that at the true sort of 4D and 5D level and what people can do and collaborate uh, in a way that wasn't possible before. And I, I think uh, other people have mentioned some of those applications today. So in terms of uh, just some examples, again, to get people thinking about uh, the art of the possible. So uh, things we talked about, the value chain, uh, one of the first pieces obviously you want to go is what can you do to fundamentally change the planning and preparation cycle for infrastructure investments? So, uh, and what's actually fun about a lot of these examples is sometimes the more cutting edge things uh, to the point that uh, I think uh, Mr. Galuski was making about leapfrogging in other parts of the world actually uh, occur, uh, you know, not in the most developed countries in the world, you know, to some extent by necessity. So this is an example from the Ivory Coast uh, in terms of how to use big data and analytics to rethink something, you know, normally fairly simple, but this was about bus routing. Uh, and what they were able to do was get their hands on all of the cell phone data usage and actually identify where people actually are at different points in time during the day. And rather than simply building a road network based on an old logic, they built it on based on where people actually are and function throughout the day. And as a result, uh, you know, we're able to achieve a 10% reduction in transit times by being more intelligent in how they did the planning up front. That's the kind of data that exists in every city in the world. And obviously, we've got to screen it for privacy and other things. But to not be taking advantage of opportunities like that is a real missed opportunity um, from a planning perspective. And, and, and uh, you know, Santiago, you can comment on this as well as you want. But, but the opportunity to use real-time data uh, in terms of management of, of traffic flows and things are now a little bit more on the O&M side of the equation. Uh, you know, right now, you, with GPS sensors, uh, with what you can gather from people using Waze, Google Maps, et cetera, there's no reason in real time where you shouldn't know exactly where every pothole is, every light that's broken, and the ability to turn lanes on and off in real time 
to substantially manage the traffic. You know, Copenhagen is the first uh, place in the world that's really sort of developed a completely robust GPS sensor system around this. Uh, it's integrated into you know, how they manage almost all of their traffic flows and at least what the data would suggest. And there's probably a lot of other structural reasons for this, but it certainly has one of the better commuting times on planet Earth of any major uh, industrialized city. But, but again, the fact that most, you know, how many traffic lights today are managed in any intelligent way in a city? You know, how many minutes of queuing are spent at every intersection when there's no cars coming the other way? If you add that up cumulatively, there's quite a lot you can do to unlock uh, congestion utilization. You want to talk about this one, Santiago? Yeah. And if we move a little bit from the planning into more how do you engage stakeholders and, and the wider community in the planning, um, and I think this is a point that was brought up, you know, definitely throughout the morning and during the lunchtime, is really about you know, getting out to citizens and getting out to the community early on, bringing them on and being part of the actual planning and using, you know, the social network uh, out there to actually, you know, bring them on from the start and make them feel part of the, part of the process. And again, as Jeff mentioned, you know, a lot of examples out there. This is an example uh, in Brazil where in Sao Paulo they've used it uh, you know, to great success to be able to involve folks that are, you know, probably usually left in the fringes because they can't attend a five o'clock meeting on a Tuesday night to, uh, to put in their comments. And I think if you stretch, you know, first of all, you know, almost every infrastructure project, whether it's at your local city all the way up to the federal government, has a public consultation period. You know, today that's managed by posting something in a paper nobody reads for two months from now to have 15 people with, you know, really strong interest physically show up, give comments, you know, another public cycle. But imagine the opportunities to get way more input from people in real time. And then, you know, take, you guys have talked, I think, a little bit today about, like, you know, the GVIP platform that's here. Mm -hmm. But if you imagine you could avail yourself in real time of all the expert network around the world to provide, you know, comment and input on different regulatory reviews and things, the opportunity to compress the cycle time of the part that's the stack of paper that goes to the size of this room is really substantial in terms of what you can save. So Norm, I hope you noted that opportunity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was no pay for that plug. So, um, uh, yeah, moving to a few other areas, now if you get into the heart of, okay, what can we do in the ENC project delivery side itself, and obviously there's, there's elements of speed, cost, cost, quality, and safety, uh, that we think can all be improved substantially from digital technologies. And we think one of the things that, you know, is going to most revolutionize uh, the engineering community on a go-forward basis is the opportunity to crowdsource the best designs from the greatest minds all around the world. So uh, one of the companies that we find is, is, is leading the way in innovative thinking on this, uh, which, which probably won't come as any surprise, is General Electric. Uh, and so one of the first efforts they did on this, uh, which was quite successful, was they tried to take a, a piece of the plane um, that was not something that their engineering group would normally have the time or the economics to be able to address. So they looked at the brackets that hang the engines on the plane, which are very, very heavy uh, and have a huge amount of impact on fuel, uh, but was an area that their engineers had not looked at in decades and it would have cost you know, millions of dollars of engineering, in-house engineering time to look at that. So instead, uh, what they decided to do was they, crowds they crowdsourced the design. So they basically sent out uh, you know, a set of uh, requests or specs they were interested in to an engineering community around the world of over a million engineers. They got back over a thousand completed submittals of ideas from it. Uh, I, I think of which there were somewhere close to 100 which were actually completely fully baked and, and viable. Uh, and at the end of the day, there was a design uh, from an uh, individual engineer in Indonesia where they paid him $7,000 or $7,500 uh, for his design, but it took more than 50% of the weight out of the bracket. You know, and, and his solution was actually pretty simple in the end of the day. You know, the, uh, rather than being one big physical bracket, he, he built it, but from a 3D printing perspective, it has all kinds of holes in it. You know, so it's not 
just one big phys physical piece of metal in the normal sense uh, that would be welded or cast, but a different way to do it. So they're, they're moving forward uh, in terms of that and what you can do. But obviously, comparing a $7,000 cost, now there's obviously the overhead cost and things to manage it to what might have been 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars of internal engineering time, that's pretty radical in terms of what you can do. So, you know, I think we'd encourage all project owners and engineering firms to be thinking about, you know, what are the opportunities to take advantage of this? And then, you know, more real time from a newspaper perspective, and I think there's probably some AECOM guys here who can comment on it, but, uh, you know, Elon Musk and the Hyperloop uh, are also trying to take advantage of this and you know, crowdsourcing a lot of engineers for the design, I think probably based on an equity stake in the venture, mm -hmm. uh, and obviously using a lot of the collaboration tools like you know, BIM related and other things to enable that to happen. Uh, but increasingly, we think you'll see more and more of you know, leveraging all of the smart minds around the world to find the best ideas at the lowest possible cost, which has both very exciting possibilities and obviously has some scarier possibilities in terms of you know, where job creation happens and not, so people will have to think thoughtfully about this. Um, I'll skip that one. Um, obviously, yeah, I think we, 3D printing is an area uh, which is, you know, we think it offers enormous possibilities here as well. Uh, you know, folks that you would often find here in the room, people like Skanska and others are really pushing the envelope in terms of things that can be done here. But, but the real value comes at the end of the day uh, from, you know, you can take out substantial amounts of materials uh, that you, did, you wouldn't have been able to do before in a casting or welding process. The opportunity to reduce the weight of things, which has huge impacts on fuel cost, especially throughout transport infrastructure, uh, is one of the biggest benefits. And then the time associated with, you know, if you don't have to have a bunch of different pieces come from a bunch of different places to be all welded together, uh, as well as the labor intensity of that is quite substantial. Yeah. I think to me also what's interesting is uh, 3D printing and a lot of these technologies also allow a lot of you know, folks more you know, in the edges uh, to also innovate. And one of the examples around WinSun is that you see a, you know, an ability to you know, build 10 houses within a day with a 3D printer on site. It's sort of allowing companies that are not necessarily the leaders to innovate and you know, to maybe leapfrog. And that also creates sort of new industry dynamics that you have to you know, take into account. It's a good, it's a good thought, because I, I think uh, when you talk to uh, you know, some firms and say what, it, what really worries you in the space, it's not that their normal competitors will out-innovate them, it's that they are afraid that, the, are afraid that the people who will design the future, you know, engineering and mobility and traffic management solutions and things for the world will be people like, you know, Google, et cetera. That will be a whole new set of competitors, you know, to think about that will leapfrog, you know, what the traditional uh, set of players mm -hmm. is thinking about. So some, something to be on the mind of. Uh, robotics, obviously, uh, also another really important area. And each, each year, I think, in infrastructure, you continue to see new applications of this. Uh, you know, tunneling ins inspection robots, you have automated bricklaying and things now, automated welding. I think, uh, you know, Komatsu has gotten to fully autonomous bulldozers, you know, managed by, by drones in the field. Uh, but the opportunity to improve precision, uh, linking this to the, you know, your BIM system and exactly, you know, every little micro inch of dirt that you're moving uh, without a lot of labor is pretty substantial. And then the safety benefits here are quite huge as well, because obviously if you can use like a robotic arc welder, rather than having human beings have to hang out over a bridge doing it, you know, your safety rate's gonna improve pretty substantially as well, uh, which is an example here, you know, that probably many people in this room are close to, but on the new Tap and Z uh, redesign, there's a pretty significant use of robotic welding. Uh, you know, it's a one real-time example of really pushing the envelope on this. And, and it probably also a segue, a topic for a, a different day, but we do think there's an interaction maybe in a lot of these, the ability to pre be creative with often where you're using a large design build structure. And so this is obviously a large design build joint venture. Uh, you know, I think we're finding that those often are the places that facilitate quite a lot of innovation to happen. Uh, so there's obviously an interaction with project delivery as well. Uh, I don't know, Santiago, you, you want to skip that one? Yeah. All right. 
you want to say on this one? No, I think, you know, in line with what I think we've touched upon a lot of this, but it's, it's really around the monitoring and surveillance. And to a certain degree, I don't know, I call this sort of like the big brother uh, slide, but it's essentially your ability to really have an a incredible amount of data and knowledge of what's happening. In, and the key to that is be able to act quickly and well, preferably preempt issues, but if not also act quickly, uh, you know, that obviously that will lead directly to, to savings in time and cost and really is, is using the whole uh, set of technologies and that's one of the challenges here is about mm -hmm. orchestrating, you know, all these different technologies and using the data uh, efficiently and effectively and being quick, you know, or using the, going from the data to actually decisions. Yeah, I think it's that, you know, the, the integration of the, the 3D modeling, all that's in the BIM, you know, capabilities now with all the geospatial overlays that you're talking about, and now the ability to fully integrate project schedule and exactly where materials and people are in real time that is, is really allowing people to take out substantial amounts of cost and how they do estimating and how they move people and materials around to be at exactly at the right place at the right time. A lot of this is really about how you how do you eliminate as much queuing as you possibly can. And I think in a second we'll talk about implications, but you know probably one of the things that you can see here, the the type of skills that are going to be needed to you know use this technology and not only spend a lot of money on flashy drones, but actually use the drones in an effective manner will require a lot of change. Uh, you know, through all the players, and we'll talk a little bit more about those implications. I think. In a uh, this one is fun, I think a good example as well is, you know, w there are so many applications now that consumers are using and virtually everyone in the, certainly in the industrialized world has a GPS sensor in their phone. When you put the capabilities of those two things together, you know, again, imagine if every city on planet Earth was using all of the data from Waze in a partnership way in real time for how they manage, not just, you know, infra traffic management, but what you fix, uh, wh what you build based on what people actually use uh, and project in a really real way. You know, these are opportunities that exist, you know, not in the, the distant future, they exist right now. Uh, obviously it takes, you know, someone to be able to use them and integrate them and have the capability to take advantage of it. Uh, but there are cities already over the world, I think over 10 partners who are now starting to do this. Clearly, you know, anyone who's driven through Brazilian rush hour traffic knows there's still a long way to go. Uh, but there are, uh, you know, again, a lot of opportunities like this that we think are, are pretty game changing. Um, let's skip that one. Uh, anything on, I think we've talked already a little bit about just that BIM is at the centerpiece of this. And uh, I think many people in this room are, are leading that, uh, I think, uh, evolution on the cutting edge. Uh, but this is an area where we think substantial additional investment and encouragement to make that investment is needed. And, you know, because if you if you say at some level, um, what's one of the reasons uh, that we don't have sort of completely mass adoption of a lot of these technological platforms? You know, we have a we still have a very fragmented global engineering and construction industry. So the scale of investment that's required, you know, certainly for any mid-sized firm or small firm is beyond, beyond the reach of many. So we think this is an area where you're likely to see a lot of the really big firms lead, and you're also likely to see a lot of innovation driven, again, by these large design build joint ventures and consortiums uh, where you have you know, multi-billion dollar projects and an opportunity to innovate and put in place a creative set of systems as a way to drive this transformation. So we do think there's an intersection uh, between you know, how much things, you know, how much design build and things you can put in place, as well as the ability to adopt this. And I'll, uh, Mark, maybe you can take it from here. Yeah, maybe just show what that translates into savings. You have the yeah. clicker? I got it. Got it. Um, thank you. So what does that mean? I mean, that means um, that uh, in an ideal world, uh, just looking at global non-residential construction, we're talking about over a trillion uh, dollars. I don't mean to sound like a certain candidate. Over a trillion dollars per annum uh, in, in cost reduction potential. Um, and that's not even counting uh, additional upside in, in operations costs and O&M costs. So um, the stakes are huge, the opportunities are, are huge. What I'd like to do, I guess in the interest of time, is maybe just leave you with some takeaways and um, 
really want to leave some time for, for discussion. Um, and a lot of what we've shared with you today and, um, and, and these takeaways are in, in a report that's available to you outside. Um, so if I could leave you with three things, uh, it would be the following. Um, first of all, what is digital uh, in infrastructure? It's a huge opportunity. Infrastructure is ripe for change. We saw the, um, uh, the, the figures that I think we've been sharing with the uh, ENC community for a number of years and, and uh, um, about the uh, productivity gap. Um, this is really a, a game changer for, for our industry. Um, and BIM clearly, clearly at the at the center of that, um, and I think a very useful model that that, that Jeff shared that uh, that is also in, in the report to, to think about the whole life cycle uh, approach to, to BIM. Um, what is the impact? Uh, we're talking over a trillion dollars in, in ENC, uh, up to a trillion and a half, uh, including these um, operations benefits, uh, and it's across uh, all sectors. Um, obviously, the opportunity will be different. Uh, sec uh, sector to sector, but uh, as we saw some of the examples um, which, um, which we've studied, uh, we, we come away with seeing the, um, uh, the highest uh, opportunities actually in uh, infrastructure construction. So very exciting, I think, for, for those of us who, uh, who live in that, in that space. Final takeaway um, is, you know, what does this mean for each of us uh, in the room? I think for both project owners and, and governments, um, it's about thinking creatively and, and, and perhaps a bit, uh, a bit proactively and, and, um, and in some cases coercively about how to speed adaptation. Um, for project owners um, to really demand um, and, and create an incent incentives uh, for, uh, for digital technologies to be, um, to be adopted uh, explicitly, um, uh, explicitly, demanding uh, the adoption of these technologies in, in RFPs. Uh, for governments, create the enabling environment. I think we heard uh, earlier today the, the best example probably out there, which is the, uh, the uh, British government uh, mandating uh, BIM in, um, uh, in infrastructure projects uh, as part of their initiative. I mean, it's that kind of uh, forceful uh, leadership that I think uh, we, can, we should expect uh, from our from our governments and uh, and I think the UK is is leading the way and other governments too I think showing uh, the uh, and and being able to quantify uh, the impacts of, of that kind of practice and then finally for the for the ENCs um, uh, in the room and and those that uh, we work with uh, clearly digital is a huge transformation um, it's it's a ra the reason why it's unlocking so much value is that it is a radical change from practices in the past. Um, so we need to adjust our business models, respond uh, to, the, to the new opportunities, uh, but also the challenges. This involves investment, this involves time, um, when uh, for um, companies that perhaps lack the scale, I think there's a, there's a, a real need, uh, perhaps not for consolidation, but for at least create more creative alliances and consortia than might have existed in the past. So I just want to leave you with those three um, those, those three ideas, and um, and then shamelessly plug our <laughs> our report. Uh, seriously, it is available. It just came out uh, for this conference, um, and uh, we we encourage all of you to read it. We'd be very interested in your comments, your input, um, and uh, and also um, just a heads up that we have a, a long and deep relationship with the with the World Economic Forum uh, among infrastructure topics, including construction, and we'll be having. Uh, another report that I think will be partic particularly interesting for this group from an international standpoint uh, that'll be coming out uh, shortly. So let, let, let's stop there and I think we can open it up for questions, comments, discussion, and uh, we'll do our best to respond. And uh, for Norm and your team, how much time should we give about, I know we're running behind. I know you, about 10 or 15 minutes. Great, let's open it up. Hi, Peter. Hi. Uh, I have a question. Just it's actually, I asked you to play kind of a role-based exercise around, uh, uh, there's a lot of inertia, obviously, in moving, particularly in a kind of a transformational exercise. So can you, can you kind of go over the role of uh, the kind of innovation officer within the, the supply side and the demand side, and some of the kind of preconditions that you would see necessary on the, say, the public, if the, for public sector to enable this type of change, and then on the supply side, 
type of preconditions, and then how do you get them together? So kind of play, put yourself in a role-based position, and how do you get this over the inertia? I think probably there's no, um, there's not one answer to that. It's obviously very multifaceted, I think, at the end of the day. But I, th I think <clears throat> I would start probably first with a perspective of uh, this has got to be driven, mandated, wanted, and enabled to a large extent by the governments and project owners. Because at the end of the day, they're bitter, yeah. If you're bidding on something and the rules are set up in a way to essentially incentivize you to deliver the same design that's tried and true for the last 30 years, you're, you know, you have every incentive not to innovate. Uh, and that's, that's probably the case uh, in more procurements than not that are out there. So I, I think we would think there's a, a number of recipes. One is obviously, you know, and it's a little harder in the US context because you have a lot of different places, but if you could get um, a mandate like the UK has for something like BIM on all major infrastructure projects. Maybe that's for a state, maybe that's for some slice of DOT. Uh, you know, that can obviously drive a lot of change. You know, at a smaller scale on individual projects, if you can allow individual procurements to happen in such a way that you actually explicitly say, I'd like, you know, we want to see, you know, how you would utilize the following new technologies to provide an innovative or a value engineered design, you know, I think, so how you structure the specific procurement is important. And then I, I think some of it's probably around flexibility, which is I think some of these will be very difficult in a classic, a classical structure where you hire the project manager, the engineer, and the construction firm all on independent basis. I think what we're seeing is, you know, where you can encourage a design build type process, the flexibility that those people have to deliver in more of a, I've got a fixed cost and schedule I have to meet, but underneath, I can innovate as a team and how you do that. I think, so, so I think what project delivery mechanisms you have um, and how it relates to how you want to influence technology are probably pretty important. Uh, you know, I think from the, from the company side, it's, it's a little trickier because I don't know that we just go to all, any of our ENC clients and say the answer is to drop a chief technology officer in the middle and hope to transform everybody. That feels like a recipe for failure uh, and sort of culturally beating your head against the wall. So I almost think what you, you have to find, you have to find the big bellwether, multi-billion dollar projects in the company that become the flywheel and the catalyst for change that have the project economics that support that layer of technology to deliver and that, that success story, you know, then starts to permeate from there. I mean, at least that's, that's my intuition uh, on how it's probably most likely to work, uh, but I don't know if others have a view. Yeah, no, I, I just want to pick up a piece of your question, Mike, and maybe throw it back out uh, to, to this group. Uh, if there's anyone here who, uh, either on the ENC side or on the project owner side, who have been part of a procurement where there, was either in, there were either incentives or mandates <coughs> uh, to use um, some form of, uh, of digital solutions or BIM, I don't know if there's anyone who's ex experienced that yet. Um, okay, so <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> Especially those of you who work in the UK, in the UK but, uh, but elsewhere too, so I was just curious. Good. What are the other questions, comments? Hi, uh, I wonder whether you could amplify a little bit on uh, the crowdsourcing example that you gave. Um, it all sounds very philanthropic. <laughs> so how do I get paid for my great ideas, you know, uh, that incentivizes me to even answer a crowdsourcing um, procurement? I think it's probably, you know, what they say, where you stand depends on where you sit, you know, and uh, apparently for a... Uh, a freelance engineer in Indonesia, 7,500 bucks was a pretty good, pretty good deal. Uh, obviously, it depends on, on who you are and where you are. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess what I can say, certainly even in our business, I'm always shocked if you send out a free rent, a lance request for, you know, I'd really like to find a PhD person who can model an automation flow for XYZ factory. The number of people you come back with a bid is shockingly high. Enough, enough that you can actually usually afford to double and triple source it uh, to make sure that at least one of them works. 
so you can actually even build in redundancy. But but I think I, I think at the end of the day, the supply of the supply of talent that's around the world and the economics of the places where they sit are such that, um, at least for a while anyway, I think you know there's 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 no lack of creative responses that are out there. And frankly, it's probably you know for some people they make they may be getting you know psychic income as much as anything else out of participating in some of these. But it, your point is a fair question. Right, and in this case, I think it's a very clear case <coughs> where um, we're talking about a clearly delineated package. Um, that could be worked on, uh, and that's a, diff it's a different process and a different dynamic where it's by definition a more collaborative project, um, uh, kind of a, uh, like we like we open source software as, as an example, which yeah. is obviously much more of an ecosystem. But, um, but obviously on the other end, to your point, I mean the Hyperloop example that was on there is, you know, crowdsourced engineers, largely domestic, making a bet, I'm willing to put in my time for equity in the Hyperloop. Or, now, that may be a fabulous investment or an atrocious investment, but uh, but I think th there's no limit to the possible ways that you can think about creativity in terms of upside and other things as it relates. All right, well maybe, maybe that's it. But anyhow, please feel free to Feel free to pick up a copy of the report. I think there's some on the desk outside in other places. And uh, you know, let us, please send us your feedback. Uh, we'd love to hear it. And or grab us. I mean, we're around, um, about five, five or six of us around through, through the conference. Uh, we're honored to be the knowledge partner with CGLA. And uh, so don't hesitate to contact us uh, any way you want. Thank you. When do we get the presentations? <laughs> so the uh, BCG presentations will be up uh, Friday, Monday at the latest, but uh, that's going to be available to you guys as well. All the presentations will be available. But thanks so much, uh, Mark, one more time, and Jeff and Santiago. Really appreciate it, and thanks for coming. Uh, we're